But maybe just to save time, I, I will read loud uh, a summary of uh, what we had last time, because it was already a week ago. Uh, so we discussed a category of representation of ergodic actions. So main players is uh, energetic action, S on X. And again, I reserved letters like S and T for locally compact groups with not algebraic structure a priori. And G and H will, uh, for us, uh, identify themselves as algebraic groups. So this is a typical notation that we adopt. And, uh, but we have this connecting homomorphism, rho, from S to G, continuous homomorphism. Um, and now an object of our uh, category of representation is uh, uh, this equivalent map, uh, phi to V, where, G, where, where V is a G action in the category, in the world of algebraic geometry. And the morphism is a commutative diagram of this sort when the right-hand side, again, is, uh, is algebraic ge algebra geometrical object. So this is nice uh, category of representation. But it's not, I mean, the tension between complicated dynamics uh, or ergodicity in one side and very simple dynamics that we have in the algebraic world uh, create uh, the existence of this uh, initial object of, in this category that I didn't introduce the name. Usually we call it gate because this is the entrance gate for X into the algebraic world. A another metaphor that one can use uh, is that uh, X S on X is a naked body, and a representation is some alge algebraic cloth, uh, clothing that you put on it. And maybe this is the underwear, that this is the first clothes that uh, it, is, it is able to, uh, to get, and it's behind everything else. It's, it's the father of all other uh, representations. Uh, I'm just summarizing what we had. Um, right, H0 is a uh, racy cloth. And H0 is a risky clause, yes. Uh, K subgroup. By this, I mean the risky clause in the K category, and the fight over K. Um, and again, uh, things I say uh, pretty much works with very little modification over arbitrary local field of arbitrary characteristic, and in fact, arbit arbitrary complete uh, field with absolute value. Nevertheless, uh, just to avoid uh, fine things, I mean, difference between groups and their K points and such things, I, um, I typically think uh, of my local field K at, as being of characteristic zero. Um, okay, and now we had two theorems uh, that we already proved about uh, existence or non-existence of uh, non-trivial gates uh, in the weak mi weakly mixing case. So classical uh, PMP action and metric ergodicity, which is equivalent to the classical weakly mixing uh, assumption, the gate is trivial. This means that this point, uh, this space is a point. H0 is G. And uh, all actions, or all maps for X are just com coming from fixed points. Uh, and the non-trivial theorem, uh, not so hard to prove after machinery is, uh, is made, but uh, it's, it's a non-trivial, and this is kind of the engine of, uh, of the starter of, of many of the techniques that we, we will uh, encounter, is the non-triviality of uh, the gate when uh, we have amenable uh, action, which is also uh, metrically ergodic. ME here stands for metrically ergodic. Um, and with this extra assumption that G is simple and the map is unbounded, and the remark here is just if you, uh, if you think how, to, how could these theorems stand together, uh, then you should know that, uh, I mean, typically those actions, PMP actions, are not amenable, unless S itself is amenable. So, uh, so these theorems do hold simultaneously. Okay, and um, today I intend to, uh, to discuss uh, Mainly, the main object is uh, lattices in product, and I will prove a rigidity result about those. Um, but there is some uh, leftover from last time that I uh, wanted to do. So I'll start with this. And this is a, a simple but very important notion uh, of oh, oh, functoriality. Very important observation related to functoriality. 
So uh, what happens if, if I uh, change uh, the main player S on X? So I still have, uh, still I, I'm fixing this part of the equation, uh, but now I'll, I will consider different X, uh, different S actions. Uh, so I consider, uh, in fact, if you wish, the category, I will use these fancy terms, uh, I think it's useful, uh, of S ergodic actions. These are the possible X guys. And to each one, the gate provides uh, an element in the category of uh, kg uh, varieties. In fact, coset spaces. So for x, not only that we found a space, um, in fact, we find a map between them, but now just uh, don't care too much about this map, just we assign to x a guy g mod h. And if we add another guy y, then we would, would get some g mod, um, let, me, let me number it, right? And the functionality is the following observation. If I have a map here, pi, then I could view g mod h1 as an algebraic representation of x. So I will get a unique such map, which I could, I, I will denote theta of pi. Oh, in fact, maybe fancy annotation would be the gate of pi. I'm applying the gate functor. This is how it acts on morphisms, but let me just denote it theta of pi. And uh, I proved for you this uh, functoriality, it's very easy, um, but it has a, a remarkable uh, consequence. And it is the following. Uh, if we take x, uh, y to be x itself, but pi here to be a non-trivial automorphism, or a priori non-trivial, then uh, we look at an element in the automorphism group of X, and also these spaces will be the same. Uh, actually, uh, to be uh, very formal, there is a choice made. To each object, I can uh, define this in many uh, equivalent ways. I, I make choices when constructing this functor. But once this choice is made, uh, then uh, I will get an element theta of pi in the automorphism group, in the G automorphism group of G mod H0. Now, this automorphism group could be identified naturally with a familiar object, and this is the normalizer uh, in G of H0 modulo H0, which act on the right, on this corset space. G act on the left, and whatever commutes with G is a, is an, a multiplication by a normalizer element, a normalizing element, where H0 itself uh, act trivially. So this is uh, an identification, and usually, uh, now this is just a notation, usually I'll, I will just denote it N0 mod H0 or N mod H0, and uh, I hope uh, things will be clear from notation. Uh, so, uh, and moreover, if you, if you think about it, you realize that uh, we, we gain an extra equivalence. This phi zero of ours uh, now is, oh, a, x is acted upon by this product of groups. And this is acted upon by this product of group. 
And this map theta uh, provides extra equivariance of this action. So this little observation will be uh, most important for us. So um, are there any questions about this? OK. So and now I will uh, fix this. And I will move to another subject. I will introduce the notion of uh, and discuss a bit lattices in product and discuss a uh, relevant uh, super rigidity result. And uh, later on, I suppose, after the break, I will prove the result. So but now uh, the, the remaining of this uh, time is, is a little introduction to the uh, subject of lattices in product. So uh, I will forget about uh, this uh, theory of uh, gates for a while. So if there are any questions about the picture, now it's a good time. So uh, let me give a, a little introduction. Take the ring, z square root 2, and I can embed it into the reals, an embedding of rings, in two different ways. Uh, the usual embedding and its Galois conjugates. Uh, this field is totally real, so these this are uh, indeed uh, two embeddings into the real. And uh, the image uh, is a lattice, is a ring lattice. A similar phenomena happens if I take the ring z1 uh, over p and I embed it as usual in the, in the real, but also I can take a different completion p adic one, which uh, same p, otherwise uh, the image would be compact, and get again a lattice. And uh, these two, I can, for these two uh, injection, I can plug the SLN uh, functor and get a natural map. Uh, which I can identified as follow. And this injection now, again, that's not entirely trivial, but it is correct, and I think uh, we all know it uh, here, uh, this is a lattice. Uh, and similarly, this embedding is a lattice. Uh, and these lattices, I mean, they're not just lattices in groups, they are lattices in a product of groups, and they uh, have the uh, extra property. I mean, if I project z square root 2 into one, just one factor, just one r, uh, it is dense. And same for each of the other uh, four maps that, they can, uh, that are on the level of rings on the board. And, and, and it follows uh, that the same goes for groups. So we get the irreducibility, uh, which now I'm giving you uh, as an abstract definition. Uh, so a lattice uh, is irreducible if uh, let me, the projection to each factor is dense. Uh, that's a name. Uh, and, and again, these classical examples are examples of irreducible lattices in, in products. And uh, in the theory of arithmetic groups, this notion is, is uh, we find it all over the place. And um, let me now give an ergodic interpretation of this piece. Uh, if gamma, I will typically assume, um, let's, uh, let's agree that typically, I will assume that gamma does not intersect each of the factors. So when I project it, I can just uh, identify the image with gamma itself. So there is a copy of gamma inside S1. I mean, I should have divided by the kernel of this projection map, which is the intersection of gamma with S2. But let's not bother about it uh, here. 
So uh, I will not use this compass notation usually. Uh, so gamma is uh, dense in S1. Uh, if gamma wasn't dense in S1, then, the, oh, no, recall that S1 itself is a Lebesgue space. It has the Haar measure. If gamma wasn't dense, the action of gamma on the S1 would not be ergodic because I could just factor the image of gamma, the closure of the image of gamma, call it T, and have a map on S mod T, uh, which is not, uh, which, I mean, S mod T will be the space of a ergodic uh, component, or at least uh, S to S mod T will be a, a gamma invariant map. Uh, so I actually, I claim uh, that uh, the density of gamma inside uh, S whatever is equivalent to ergodicity. Gamma act ergodically on SI is ergodic. So I, I try to explain uh, why if gamma wasn't dense in SI, then the action would not be ergodic. But if gamma is dense in SI, let me explain uh, why is the action ergodic? Um, the thing is that uh, S, the action of SI on L infinity SI uh, is continuous. So this is a bit, uh, I mean, it, it is continuous. Hence, if I have a gamma invariant point and gamma is dense, this point is invariant under S. So. To, so, to show that the action uh, is ergodic of gamma on L infinity SI, I need to show that there is no invariant uh, function, or every invariant function is constant. If I have a gamma invariant function, then this function is already invariant under SI, I claim, uh, hence it must be constant. Now, uh, you might object. Uh, I mean, I think you don't object because you have seen it before. Uh, you might object because this is not really the case if I consider the norm topology on SI, on L infinity. But there is another topology, which is uh, the weak uh, is continuous for the weak star topology. Coming from the duality between, uh, just a minute, the duality between L infinity and, and L1. So there is a, a finer topology, oh, sorry, a coarser topology on this space under which the action of S is continuous and uh, therefore every Fixed point under a dense subgroup is fixed under the, the full group. Yes, please. You want SI or gamma I drive and L infinity? I'm saying that I mean, this is a phenomenon that I'm using in proving this equivalence uh, easily. It is just a hint how to prove it. Uh, okay? I mean, okay, and now I, I want to rephrase um, once more, or twice more, or whatever. Uh, now, gamma on SI uh, is uh, ergodic. So obviously, gamma, uh, let's, let's choose coordinate. I mean, just let's break symmetry here. It's easier for me. Uh, gamma times S2 then is ergodic on S1 times S2, right? I just added one. Uh, lame coordinate here, uh, and now uh, let, so S2 acts on S2 and gamma act uh, diagonally. You forgot diagonally. Ah, uh, is, uh, thank you. Uh, and now let me divide by gamma. Uh, so, and, and this is S. So, so now I assume that gamma acts diagonally on these, and S1, maybe uh, gamma act, okay, whatever. Uh, and this is like S1 act on S mod gamma ergodically. So, uh, this uh, irreducibility, again, so, let me repeat, of uh, gamma on S is equivalent to uh, Si on 
S mod gamma is a godic. That's the finding. So this is a rephrasing of this uh, group theoretical uh, statement in a godic theoretical fashion. Uh, so this is, again, very, very uh, standard, but very, very useful as well. And of course, uh, we, we will take the ergodic point of view and we'll use it. Uh, now, uh, now I want to, uh, okay, we have this now, and so we understand to some extent uh, irreducibility. And uh, I want now to elaborate a little bit about this notion and maybe why is it so important in arithmeticity? I will uh, form some sort of a, an inverse, uh, a converse to the, the notion of a, a irreducibility of a lattice by means of commensurability. Uh, so let me uh, do this. Uh, so let me start with, uh, again, the setting. So this is, I mean, title here is discussion. Uh, this is an irreducible lattice. Uh, assume that S1 that uh, S1 is a TDLC group, totally disconnected locally compact group. So it's uh, it's connected component of the identity is trivial. Um, so this implies that uh, there exists in S1 a subgroup K1, which is a compact open. Now, a very nice feature of uh, compact open subgroups inside uh, locally compact groups uh, is that uh, um, they are commensurated. Uh, shall I define the notion of commensurability? Shall I? Um, I know, uh, K1, K2 uh, in S are commensurated. Commensurable. Commensurated. Commensurable, I think. Uh, if there is intersection inside each is a finite index. K inside S is commensurable, commensurated if conjugation, if for every uh, conjugation of K, we get a commensurable group. Now, if K in S is uh, uh, compact and open, then these two are compact open subgroups, and uh, it is easy to show that every pair of compact open subgroups are commensurable, because the intersection is again uh, open, and finally cover each of these compact guys. That's why we get uh, So uh, somehow, in fact, I will explain in a minute, or I'll recall in a minute, that commensurability is always related to this phenomena of, in, in group theory, uh, of compact open things. Um, now, if I have a totally disconnected group, uh, then uh, Vadanzig, uh, a theorem tells me that there exists a compact open subgroup in it, uh, and these guys form uh, a commensurability class in S, a canonical one, in fact. Uh, like the commensurability class of finite groups in, inside countable groups, which actually is an example of such a uh, thing. Uh, so, uh, I'm having this thing, and... Uh, so you say that K in S is commensurative. If S is a commensurator of, of K, that's... Yeah, okay. I mean, there is commensurability of two groups and yes. a commensuration of a, 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 a subgroup in a group. You mean that the commensurator is full? Commensurator is full, yes. 
uh, standard notation, no, not my fault. Um, but now let me back, go back. Uh, okay, um, so, this, so we have this commensurated group. Also, I can uh, intersect this with gamma, and I, I, will, I, I will define lambda to be uh, the intersection of gamma with Now k1 times s2 is commensurated in s1 times s2. And its intersection with gamma then is commensurated in gamma. It follows. Uh, uh, is commensurated in gamma on one hand, but also uh, you see, this is an open subgroup of S, and I uh, intersected a lattice with it. So also this is a lattice in, in S. Uh, sorry, uh, is a lattice, and is a lattice in that guy. What is this board? Uh, right. So... Uh, now, uh, I want to ignore K1, which is just, now I'm working in this group, which is a, uh, which S1, it's, uh, sorry, which S2 itself is a factor of it by a compact kernel. So I want to project things into S2 and do this identification I do, so uh, not my notation will, will not be cumbersome. So uh, please allow me to, uh, to write that uh, lambda uh, is a lattice in S2. So again, totally, this is a projection of lambda to S2, uh, uh, which is commensurated, I will not write the, role, the word, uh, commensurated by the dense group gamma inside S2. So this is a very nice uh, situation, and I want to claim that this is, it is a typical one. Uh, so, uh, I will now discuss a converse. Uh, so assume having Lambda inside gamma, countable groups, inside T. This is S2 for me, but now I'm taking an abstract uh, setting. Uh, well, we have these conditions. Uh, this is a lattice. This is commensurated, and this is dense. Then, uh, I can sort of reconstruct S1 from this data. Let me call it T prime in this context. Uh, there exists T prime. TDLC. Uh, now this is locally compact, second countable. Uh, so I can find locally compact, totally disconnected group, T prime. Uh, and an embedding or a map from gamma to T prime with dense image. such that uh, the image of lambda uh, is pre-compact. Its closure is supposed to be K1. I mean, this is supposed to be uh, uh, S1, and the image of lambda is supposed to be K1. So the image is pre-compact. Uh, and gamma inside t times t prime 
is an irreducible lattice. So this is a general uh, fact. I will not re uh, reprove it for you, but uh, it is rather easy, ra rather easy. Uh, the buzzword for this is the Schlichting completion. of the pair gamma lambda. Whenever you find uh, a group and a commensurated subgroup, I mean, if lambda was not just commensurated, but normal, which is a pretty much closed uh, notion, then I could have defined gamma mod lambda. And actually, this would be my T prime in this setting. Uh, then those maps will have kernels, but it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, in general, there is sort of a analog for a quotient group thing, and this is this T prime, again, called the Schlichting completion, which actually it's very easy to uh, construct. You look at the symmetry group of gamma mod lambda with natural uh, point one convergence topology, and you embed gamma in it for its action and take the closure. That will be T prime. So there are things to prove that uh, all these properties do hold, but it is correct. Um, so let me uh, stop and breathe and, and, and say something. Uh, this if and only if thing, um, now it's an almost if and only if situation for lattices in product. I started with an arbitrary lattice in a product, only I assumed something. I assumed that S1 is totally disconnected. And then I, I try to convince you that this is a, an equivalent picture to this uh, picture of a commensurated, uh, for lattices commensurated by dense subgroup somewhere. Um, and this is typical uh, from number theory setting. This example is of this sort. We have this factor. Uh, and in fact, I want to, to say, uh, just by passing, because I think this is a very important phenomenon, not enough understood in my, in my mind, that lattices in actual Lie groups, I mean, for, for totally, for locally compact groups, are sort of, I mean, by simplicity assumption or something, they are either totally disconnected or Lie, uh, uh, simple Lie groups. And uh, lattices in, Irreducible lattices in simple Lie groups are very, very special. They are not of this kind. They, they want somehow to be of this kind. They want some commensurability phenomena, but we, we, we cannot find this K1 in, inside here, uh, so we cannot construct it. Uh, and these are comp very complicated objects, and somehow lattices in, in these groups are somewhat simpler, or we have a, a dual uh, way to view them. So always a dual way to view things uh, is, is an extra tool to play with. Any question? So uh, now I will state uh, the theorem. I'm going to state it here. OK, so. So take an irreducible lattice and consider a k-simple group and a map, an algebraic representation of the lattice, uh, which is generic in the sense that it is the risky dense and unbounded. Maybe I already said it many times. Over the reals, unbounded is included by the risky dense. 
So uh, uh, compact groups are also al always algebraic. So if we assume also that uh, G itself is non-compact, the risky density in implies unboundedness. So this is uh, an anonymous assumption. But uh, in this business, uh, periodics and other fields are very important. So uh, let me stress, nevertheless, the unbounded assumption. Uh, then, let me uh, complete the diagram. Then we have, uh, let me also give it a name. Uh, super rigidity, which is a code for the following. Uh, that I have gamma inside S. And rho uh, extends uniquely into, in fact, a continuous uh, homomorphism from S. And now uh, that's the, the, the main part of the theorem. Let me also just stress that if I map a product of groups in a risky dense fashion into a simple one, then the Zarisi closure of each factor uh, will normalize the other, uh, in fact, the full group, which is the risky, I mean, the risky closure of each will be normalized by the Zarisi closure of S itself, which is G. So uh, they cannot coexist someone, somehow, one of them should, should disappear. And it means that the uh, rho bar uh, factor from S to, uh, one of the factors. So this is just a, a byproduct. Uh, but also when, when we prove that uh, this map extends in a minute, uh, we will prove in fact that either it extends to S1 or it extends to S2. Uh, Now, the following corollary is a, an immediate uh, application of this uh, theme that I was discussing here. Uh, if lambda inside gamma inside T are as above, I guess this is the second line over there that I'm referring to. Uh, And uh, also, GK is simple, and I have a Z-dense unbounded uh, thing. Uh, then, ah, no. Uh, I'll write down. G is supposed to be K simple. Rho is supposed to be The risky dance, uh, but the unbounded assumption I will assume on lambda, lambda unbounded. If I have situation that of a, a dense subgroup inside T, which I map into a simple group and in a risky dense fashion, and now the only assumption about lambda, which is a, a commensurated subgroup of gamma, which is a lattice in T, uh, if this has an unbounded image, then we have, we can complete this diagram. So a word about this corollary. Um, it follows because, because of this uh, discussion that we had. Uh, where is? Uh, ah, because of, because of this discussion over here, I can always embed gamma inside T times T prime and apply this theorem now and have either that this map rho extends to T or to T prime. But I rule out the T prime extension because if T prime is mapped to G, then the image uh, of lambda in it is bounded and the map is assumed to be continuous. So the image of lambda will be bounded inside G, contradicting this assumption. So 
the factoring here must be from T cells. Okay, so this is just a sketch. Uh, if you see it for the first time, it could be seen arbitrary to you, but actually this is, this is a very, very important theorem by itself uh, due to Margulis. Um, what should I write it down? Uh, maybe I'll write it here. Oh, I have it here. Application. That's a criterion by Margulis. Uh, take T to be G itself, a lattice gamma inside G. Uh, is arithmetic. If, now this gamma, think of it as lambda. And we applied things in the case G equals in the corollary, uh, is arithmetic if and only if it has a dense commensurator uh, in G. So look at all elements in G which commensurate gamma. That will be a, a subgroup of G. In fact, the subgroup I want to think as gamma in this theorem, and I want to think of. Uh, about gamma as lambda, sorry for this, uh, and I want to apply uh, this, and the thing is the following. If gamma was arithmetic, if gamma is arithmetic, then it is commensurated uh, by the Q points, which is a dense subgroup in GR. I'm, I'm explaining briefly why you should believe it. Uh, the fact, the general fact that uh, uh, an arithmetic lattice uh, is commensurated by a dense subgroup is a result due to Borel. But you can believe it. Uh, you can check yourself that SLN Z is commensurated by SLN Q inside SLN R. Uh, so this should explain the implication left to right. For the implication right to left, if it has a dense commensurator, then we are in the setting here of super rigidity. And there is a general uh, explanation by Margulis, which par partially I, I hope to explore uh, in the next lecture, uh, that uh, explain why super rigidity uh, implies arithmeticity. I will not go into uh, the full explanation of this, but presumably you have seen it or you will see it somewhere else. Uh, so it's super rigidity. It's this theorem that is in the heart of this criterion, and this is a very, very uh, useful criterion uh, for ethnicity. <laughs> okay, any question about this? So now, we have a goal. We have a theorem to prove, and this will occupy uh, much of the next uh, minutes, and uh, let's see. I will erase this. So now I, I will make some preparation. So we're focusing on proving the theorem. I will not start with the proof. I will do some preparation. So uh, we have gamma. Well, we, we are under the assumption of the theorem. We have uh, S, which is S1 times S2. We have gamma, which is a, an irreducible lattice in it. Uh, we know that for each group Si, uh, I can find an action. I will call it Bi, not Xi, uh, because I think of it as a boundary action, uh, which is Uh, amenable and ME. Amenable and metrically ergodic. I claim that I we can do that. So I'm using the claim. Um, next claim 
easy one, but I will do it for you, is that the product action preserve these properties. The product action is amenable in uh, ME2. Uh, so amenability, take a non-empty uh, S compact convex set. So I will use the a notion of amenability, uh, what I call baby amenability here. Uh, the existence of maps into compact convex sets, which is what I need here, really. Uh, so I'm taking a, an S compact convex set, and I want to show that there is a, a map from B1 to B2. Uh, sorry, from B1 times B2 uh, to C, S equivalent map. Uh, so think of it as, as an S1 space, so I can find a map which commute with S1 from B1 to C. Now this guy is uh, an S2 compact. It has a natural uh, compact convex structure. So I can map B2 inside this one. So there is an S2 map of this sort. And Fubini tells me basically that there is a such a map to C. That's a very quick explanation of the amenability of the product action. Mm. And let me discuss the ME aspect. So for this, I take U, uh, an S isometric uh, metric space. So a metric space in which uh, S act isometrically, and I want to assume having a map, an S map, B1 times B2 to U. Now, fix B1, generic one, I, I use the notation. Uh, for almost every uh, B1, I'm getting a map B2 uh, to U, which is S2 equivalent. Uh, so since this is metrically ergodic, this must be constant. Uh, and by this, I'm getting a map taking an element B1 to U, taking an element here to the constant image of that map, uh, which is S1 uh, equivalent, uh, and this one is constant too. Sorry, I missed something. So on the space of ma so B1, BI is your... We are, uh, we are in amenable, amenability part. They are compact spaces or...? Yes, okay, I didn't really explain this, but... Um, well, I just wanted to understand the why this space was uh, compact. Yes, I, I, I actually didn't say it. Uh, you can view it as a, uh, that's a functional analytic uh, standard technique. You view this as a, a, a subset of L infinity B1 to C, uh, which, is, um, which is a dual space. Or maybe to be more precise, I can embed C inside a dual Banach space and, uh, and embed this thing then in a dual Banach space as well as, as a closed uh, 
subset. So, I mean, there are a game to play here, which I do not explain really uh, now. I'm just giving you the ideas. Uh, I claim that you can put a natural compact topology on the, the space of maps from a Lebesgue space into a space which is a convex compact in a, in a topological vector space, in fact. I said Banach space, but it's slightly more general. Uh, yeah, I didn't explain. Uh, and I use that, indeed, in order to find fixed point and prove amenability. Uh, the ME part is even easier because I don't need to use any, mo any, any tool which is more sophisticated than Fubini. Um, if I just look, fix the uh, first coordinate and look at the map from the second coordinate, it must be a constant by metric rodicity of, of S2. And look at the constant image here, I'm getting a map from B1 uh, to U, which is S1 equivalent, and uh, it must be constant again. So this is it. So this is, this is the proof of this claim. Um, and uh, where am I? Okay, so corollary, I already said that uh, if, I, if I take a, okay, it's a general fact that if you have a, a group acting amenably on a space, then also uh, each closed subgroup act amenably as well. That's a general fact, due to Zimmer, in fact. Um, it's, it's rather easy to show, but I will not go into it. Uh, and I actually proved to you, or sketch a proof, why uh, metric godicity uh, goes from a group to a lattice. Now, this one doesn't go to any uh, closed subgroup. Here, I, here I'm using the assumption that gamma is a lattice uh, in S. So this is an important uh, fact for me, because as you remember, uh, amenability and ME is the, the starter of our engine, of uh, the proof of rigidity result. Uh, now, another claim I will need is that uh, gamma uh, act So the action of gamma on B1 times B2 is in particular, it is ergodic in the usual sense. Now, the action of gamma on S1 times S2 is far from being ergodic. It, gamma is a closed subgroup. The action is proper. But if I just change one coordinate to the group and one coordinate I keep to, to boundary, this is something I will use in the proof, uh, then uh, this is ergodic. as well. This is not metrically ergodic nor amenable. But uh, I will just use ergodicity. Um, somehow the starter will be already given, but very soon I will replace this space with this space. And, and this space, I already uh, give you a, um, the punchline, this space has extra symmetries. If gamma act on diagonally on the left on S1, then this space has symmetries of action of S1 on the right. And with, uh, with this in mind, I, I, I will uh, be able to start getting an uh, homomorphism from, uh, uh, from S to, uh, to G, or an approximation of. So this is very, very useful. Uh, so this is an important fact. Uh, so let me... Before proving this claim, let, let me say some uh, general remarks uh, about similar settings. Uh, so the thing is that this space on the right is not just a gamma space, it's an S space. S1 acts here, S2 acts here. So um, given, oh, uh, here's a general discussion that actually uh, 
does not apply necessarily for product of groups. Uh, if I have uh, an action of, uh, of S on X, now you may ask uh, whether this restriction is ergodic. And, uh, and the claim is that this restriction is ergodic if and only if the S action on S mod gamma times X is ergodic. I, I want to replace this problem by such a thing. And let me explain this uh, because uh, this involves some very, very easy but very, very useful tricks uh, of ergodic theoretical uh, uh, nature. So uh, let me uh, sketch some things. Ergodicity of uh, gamma on x um, is equivalent, I already used this uh, very, very stupid trick, with ergodicity of, of s times gamma on s times x. Right? Uh, I just add uh, a lame extra coordinate. Uh, and here, this is... Now, so far, I, I don't use the fact that x was a priori in s space. This is true for any gamma space. And now you can uh, mod out the gamma action. Modding gamma action, modding an, uh, out an action, taking the space of orbit is something that we are not allowed to, you, to do usually in ergodic theory. We do allow when the action is proper. But the action of gamma on S is proper. So the action of gamma on S times X also is proper. We have a nice space of orbit. So I can take now a space of, a, a, what do I want to write? Sorry. Uh, I want a bit more room. So I will take the space of gamma orbit and then I will denote it by this. Uh, so this S times X over gamma is the space of gamma orbits, which is well-defined and, and nice uh, in the setting of the gamma action, on, uh, diagonal gamma action on S times X. Uh, and, and this is, this ergodicity is equivalent to that one. And this space is important. It's called the induction space from gamma to S. It's a very, very useful uh, construction. So we uh, replace gamma ergodicity with S ergodicity. This is a general remark. It has nothing to do with this extra assumption that X was an S space to begin with. Now I will add this assumption. Uh, and now, if X is an S space, I can also define the map the stupid map, that take uh, S comma X, maybe I already used this map. I will use it several times. It's a very useful observation that this map is in fact invertible. It's easy to uh, invert. Uh, but it conjugate, I will not write down because it's very uh, complicated to write down. I will explain. On this space, I have a, a gamma action. Let's say uh, I'm acting diagonally on the right on X and on the left, sorry, on the left on X and on the right on S. When I move along this map, the diagonal action on the second coordinate disappears. Remember that when I act on S from the right, I, uh, I act by gamma inverse. So uh, multiplying this by gamma inverse and this by gamma, they uh, disappear over here. So this map intertwines, this diagonal gamma map, into a gamma map which uh, happens only on the left coordinate. But also here, the S action, uh, S does act on, on the left on S, commuting with the gamma action, because I assume gamma act on the right. Uh, so this is also an S space. And the same map, now, now, don't take the S action on X. Uh, 
so we have the action of S on this object only on the left factor, from the left, and this map intertwines it with the diagonal S action. So uh, this map takes this space, the diagonal gamma space, uh, into a space on which uh, gamma act only on the left coordinate and uh, S act now diagonally. Uh, so ergodicity here is equivalent. Now I, when I divide by gamma, I'll just get this one times X, diagonal action. Okay, so this is, nothing here is complicated. Uh, for, uh, the top line is a general uh, statement of induction in ergodic theory. And the bottom line, or the, the, the fact here, the fact I was given here in this remark, uh, is saying that, in fact, induction, when I started with an S space and I did induction, I ended up with this trivial operation of taking product with S gamma, S mod gamma. Okay? So this is, again, uh, some uh, general uh, remarks. And now I, I'm back to this claim. Any, any question about this? So the induction space is uh, isomorphic to the quotient uh, S mod gamma times X? This is isomorphic yes. uh, under uh, this assumption. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And they're isomorphic as S. And they're isomorphic as S, S spaces. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, th those are trivial things, but uh, I think that they should be uh, noted. And now uh, I want to uh, go back to this uh, claim and prove it in view of this remark. So now I want to show that uh, this is ergodic. And using the remark, this is the same as showing that S acting on S mod gamma times, uh, sorry, ah, yeah, time is ergodic. I use this as my x, of course. Uh, but now, now this is s1 times s2, and in, it acts on many things times s1. Let's mod out the s1 action. So this is the same as s2 acting on s mod gamma times b2 being ergodic. Okay, uh, in fact, I mean, this is, it's very easy, but somehow I use the same trick that I used here. I, I change a bit the coordinate of the action. Whenever S1 acts, whenever S acts on S times X, I can absorb, oh, sorry. In fact, I, I went in a reverse direction. Considering the S2 action, it was acting, S2 was a part of it in here, it was acting on S mod gamma and on B2 diagonally. Uh, this piece it acted trivially. Uh, and so think of this as an X. And I inverted the action, I changed coordinate, so the action will be only on the S1, uh, the action of S1 will be only on the S1 coordinates. And then I just erase this action uh, when I consider ergodicity. Um, but this is uh, implied by the emicity of the action of S2 on B2. We, we already uh, showed that uh, whenever you have an, a metrically ergodic action, in, it implies that uh, the product action with a PMP space, with, with a PMP ergodic space, uh, is ergodic again. That was something uh, we discussed last week. Uh, and I used somewhere I explained, I guess I, I already raised this. I, I explained that irreducibility of gamma in S1 times S2 is equivalent to the, uh, the ergodicity uh, of the S2 and S1 actions on S mod gamma. Okay, so I, I do know this and I do get this. Uh, and I proved that one because this is an assumption. Uh, 
Any question? Okay. So remember, we are proving this theorem. We are in this setting, and we proved this claim and that claim. We, we made many further remarks which are useful, and maybe I will use them, but this is the, the essence. Let's take a break, and after the break, let's uh, do the proof. So our task now is to uh, prove the theorem on the right upper corner. Uh, so we, we are under the assumption there, and we found uh, bi amenable and me actions, and we found then that the action of gamma on the product is amenable and metrically ergodic. And we know what to do with uh, such a thing. Uh, Beatrice asked me in, in the, during the break, uh, but of course we could have taken, uh, by, we, we could have used the theorem that we uh, mentioned for, uh, for arbitrary group and take a, a space which is gamma uh, amenable and metrically ergodic a priori. But we want very much to keep the product symmetry that we have here. So this is why we bothered uh, to prove this claim. Uh, so we know what, what to do with the uh, amenable and metrically ergodic space. Uh, we use it to generate a gate. So, uh, okay, yeah. exist non-trivial gate. <coughs> mm. and emphasize that age is a proper k subgroup of G. And this is a gamma equivalent thing. Uh, and now this space, it is a product, but yet it does not have uh, extra symmetries. Maybe I'll, I'll rewrite it here. Uh, we found B1 times B2 uh, to G mod H, but the thing is that I can generate extra symmetries somehow by replacing this space with, with that space. And this is how I, I'm about to do it. I'll, I'll view it as a map from S1 times B1 times B2. This is not an ergodic space by the gamma action, maybe. I mean, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, using this uh, change of coordinate trick, I can assume that uh, the S1 action uh, doesn't see this uh, coordinate. Um, so, there is, uh, so uh, S1 acts, uh, only on this coordinate by uh, the same trick that we have used. I will not write it down. And um, so uh, for a generic uh, B1, we get a map uh, from S1 times B2 to G mod H. And again, H is a proper subgroup in G. <clears throat> and uh, and now we have a, we have a map. Uh, now the gamma action on S one times B two uh, is ergodic. That's the second claim over there. Uh, so I can uh, find a gate. S1 times B2 to G mod H0. I didn't use the term H0 before, uh, which is a, a gamma map. 
But also here now, uh, I have extra symmetries because I have uh, S1 acting on the other side. So this is, so now I'm using this fact we gained from factoriality and I'm adding this extra uh, equivariancy for some, uh, let me consult my note for notation, uh, for some map theta uh, from, uh, theta goes from S1 to the normalizer. Again, I use the fact that uh, this space is already uh, still ergodic, it is not as nice as the previous space, B1 times B2, which was metrically ergodic, also amenable, but ergodicity is enough and we proved it. And these space have extra symmetries. And these extra symmetries give me already some algebraic representation of S1. This is already something very, very non-trivial. I started with a gamma action and uh, with almost no work, uh, I mean, Work, we did some work previously, but uh, it, it was just uh, pushing elements from one side to another, we get uh, already a, a representation of S1, of the uh, ambient locally compact group. Uh, but we want more. The thing is that now uh, I want you to, sh to observe that N act on the uh, right-hand side here, and if I mod out this action, mod the action of N, I'm, I'm I'm getting a map to G mod N. And this map is already uh, equivalent. I mean, it's still equivalent with respect to uh, gamma, but now this map is uh, S1 invariant because the action of S1 here was via, uh, on, on this side, was via this normalizer action. So this action factor mod, mod S1. And does it gives me a map from B2 itself into here. And this is a gamma map. So now there are cases uh, to consider. I mean, is this space trivial? Is it not? So let me uh, do this. Well, I don't understand how you define your this gamma map. Wh which one? So, where do you use theta? Okay. Um, first step, we took a, a non-trivial representation here. Then I, I took, a, in fact, a, a generic a S1 orbit in here and replaced B1 by the group S1. This is something I can, I, I can always do. And got myself a, a map, a gamma map in here. Um, and use ergodicity, now I, I turn this map into a, a gate map, a minimal one. So I, I, I replaced H by maybe a smaller subgroup, H0, took the minimal one, and got a gate map. Okay, now this map is a priori gamma equivariant. And again, gamma acts diagonally on this one. But this space has extra symmetries. It has a, an automorphism group, a, which is an S1 action uh, acting just on the first factor from the other side. Gamma was acting uh, well, from left or right, I, I, now I don't remember. Uh, S1 can act on the, on the other side. And, uh, and I get some uh, map just out of functoriality into uh, the automorphism group of the target. And the map phi that I'm having um, is equivalent to also, also with respect to this one. That's a result of the functoriality. Uh, so I got myself, I, 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 afterwards I decorated this a bit more, but I got this uh, square diagram here. So th this map, and, and these are the groups uh, just uh, to indicate what kind of equivalency I have. Okay, so this is the, this is the the skeleton here of this diagram. And then I, I elaborated further. I, 
Okay, so I, I'll explain. Now, uh, I divided the action, um, I took this space, consider it with a G left action and uh, an action of the normalizer on the right, and I divided by the action of the normalizer. This is just taking the map from G mod H0 to G mod the normalizer. And here I lost, I mean, this is, this is an invariant map. And since now the S1 action over here is acting on these spaces via N, the map from here is to, uh, to here is S1 invariant. Since it is S1 invariant, its factors uh, via just the S1 orbit space, which is B2. Maybe I'll write that this is the S1 invariant map. Okay, so I got myself a new map, B2 to G mod N. Okay, now several things could happen. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe H0 is trivial, or maybe the normalizer is everything, and this space is trivial. So now I want to discuss cases. And in fact, my, my, the proof of, of ours will, will be case somehow by, by a case study uh, because we will show eventually either that the map extends to S1 or to extends to S2. And we will not prove this right away. We will show that one. Uh, it will either extend to S1 or to S2 according to uh, what H0 is here and what N are and, and what N is. So uh, this is my next thing. Uh, I will now uh, take an assumption, discuss it, and later we'll take the negation of this assumption. So um, I, I want to know that this is clear so far. So now uh, I will assume that H0 is not trivial. So uh, now H0, recall H0 is a subgroup of H, which is a proper subgroup of G, right? Uh, so uh, H0 is not G itself. If it is not trivial, uh, by simplicity, of G, I will get that N is not everything. H0 is not normal. To be normal, it must be either trivial or everything. We know that it is less than everything. We assume that it is not uh, trivial, and we get that it is not normal. So we get that this space here is a, is a non-trivial space. And now this is a representation of B2. Uh, we got a non-trivial rep of gamma acting on B2. Again, non-trivial is nice, but now I want to go down to get extra symmetries. Oh, sorry, and now we do uh, the same trick. So uh, we can take S2 times B2, just the action map, and replace B2 by a generic orbit. Uh, and we get uh, a map S2 to G mod N, a gamma. A gamma rep. Uh, so we have a map S2 to G mod N, and we take a gate, which I denoted. by G mod H2, when H2 is some smaller subgroup than N, which by itself is smaller than G. So we get a non-trivial representation of S2 as a gamma space. 
So now we have a gamma action here and G action here. So we kind of reduced, I mean, we started with B1 times B2, then we take S1 times B2, then we move to B2, and then we replace B2 uh, by S2. And, and just recall that this is ergodic. That was part of one of the equivalence uh, uh, definitions of uh, irreducibility of the lattice gamma. So now we have this, this gamma ergodic space, and we uh, now we have this. We mapped it into G mod H, and we have gamma acting on one side. But of course, now we gain symmetry uh, of S2, and that's H2, maybe N2 mod H2. Uh, for this is rho times theta 2. Theta 2 is a map from S2, the symmetries uh, of the gamma space here, to this space. And now, and, and, and now this is, is just a measurable map with lots of extra uh, equivalency. Uh, but I claim that uh, this data now uh, is enough to, uh, to finish. Let me explain this one. Oh, maybe. Oh, maybe. Uh, let me just. Ah. Uh, as before, maybe, let me do, uh, let me go to G mod N2. And this will be S2 invariant. I took the mod N. Thing. So S2 now act trivially. So S2 invariance just factors through a point here, right? Uh, so I get a gamma invariant point in here. But of course, this gamma invariant point uh, is also invariant under the closure of gamma. Gamma act via rho. I mean, I, I don't write rho, but uh, you should uh, understand that this is the image of gamma inside G. And this is G itself. So having such thing, uh, this implies uh, that uh, N2 is G. If I have G, G invariant point in, in this coset space. And this implies that H2, which is normal in N2, uh, is normal in G. So it must be uh, the trivial group. So I don't know why I started writing on this side. Let me move back uh, to the main side. Uh, so let me rewrite this map phi, it actually goes to G, G mod H2, it's just G. And here the action, this thing is just G acting on the right. And I have gamma times S2, and this is rho times some map uh, theta, did I use theta already? Theta 2. So the tar now I, I, I get that the gate is really uh, huge. It's G itself. And I get this extra equivalence. And again, uh, phi is measurable. Uh, this is not a homomorphism yet. But I claim that this picture forces having a homomorphism. In fact, it, in fact, it, it forces that uh, rho extends maybe not to theta 2, but to a conjugation of theta 2. This is what I, I will explain. And what I'm about to explain now, a, a little piece, is very important lemma that I will not phrase as a lemma, but I will use this argument over and over again. So uh, let me take, let me put this in a colored box. Whenever I have this yellow box, uh, I will get extension of a homomorphism. 
Uh, let me explain this. Um, so um, instead of the map phi that I'm having here, take the map that take uh, S. Okay, maybe you want to denote this S sub 2. This is an element in S2. Okay, I will. Take a new map that take it to phi S2 and then take the inverse of theta applies to it. And uh, this is a map, this is a new map. Theta 2. Theta two. This is a new map from S2 to G, but now I forced S2 invariance. So I get an element G. If this element was the identity, then rho is just a restriction of theta 2. Otherwise, it will be the restriction of theta 2 uh, conjugated by this element G. So let me, uh, mm, let me write uh, a little equation. Uh, or maybe before writing equation, let me write the, we got that for almost every S2, phi S2, let me just change the sides, phi S2 is G times theta S2. And now let me use the rho equivalence, uh, so take uh, for every gamma in gamma, uh, almost every S2 in S2, I will look at phi gamma S2. And I have the rho equivalence telling me that this is rho gamma phi S2. Uh, but I know that uh, I have this equation for phi S2. So this is rho gamma G theta S2. But also I can apply this equation right away uh, and get that this is G theta of gamma S2. And theta is a homomorphism, so let me write right away theta S2, and I guess I need twos. And this is for every S2. Uh, let me, uh, I mean, I could have used, I, I could have write it with uh, S2 being trivial, but I didn't know it uh, to the, for the identity element, but just take one S2 that it works and cancel it afterwards. I can cancel it from this equation and get that rho gamma uh, equals theta 2 of gamma conjugated by G. So this is what I told you. Uh, I get that uh, rho equals, what does rho equal? Rho equals the theta 2 conjugated by G, theta 2 conjugated by G applied to the projection on the second coordinate. Well, that's a complicated way to write uh, that this is, uh, the theta 2 extends to S. I mean, this right-hand side is defined for every S2. It, so it's also by projecting from S to S2, it, divide, it, it is defined for every S in S. So having the right-hand side a, a homomorphism defined for every S, the left-hand side, rho, which was a priori uh, 
defined on gamma is now a restriction of a homomorphism defined on S. Okay, so this is the resulting uh, yellow box of this assumption, and maybe I'll put an extra. I was walking under uh, this assumption. We are not done yet. I was walking under this assumption, and I got myself, by playing with symmetries, I, I got myself to this yellow box and said that, and I emphasized that such a situation always implies extension. Actually, when I go on, and the things will get a bit more complicated. Uh, when, so, uh, sorry, when I go on, uh, I will, this, will, this will be a, my goal. I mean, I, I want to prove extension. That's uh, the end result. But now, uh, after believing that we have this, such an implication, uh, we, uh, this will be our desire in the future. Okay, so that was the easiest case. Uh, so, well, just to summarize, we are done uh, under the assumption H0 non trivial. So, I'm now about to assume that H0 is trivial. Any questions so far? Now I'm assuming H0 is trivial, but of course we'll have to recall where we are because we, we took some way. So let, let, read the, let us read the proof from the start again and see where we are. So we started with such a map and soon we replace it with a map to from S1 times B2, which was still ergodic. So we took a gate of this. This is where we are. And, and now we want to assume that H0 here is trivial. So actually what we see here is G itself. Uh, let me consult my note just... Uh, Okay, so, uh, so also N, uh, the normalizer of H0 is G itself. And this map uh, theta 1 that we got, or theta it was, um, is a map from S1 to G itself, right? Uh, we had theta uh, from S1 to N mod H, which now is G. So to summarize, we have the following uh, data. S1 times B2. I'm rewriting this. Goes to G. And this is acted by gamma times S1. And there is a map here to G times G. And this is a... Uh, Rho times theta. So, uh, look, previously we had uh, theta 2, a map from S2 to G, where it's written somewhere. Uh, I had theta 2, a map from S2 to G, under one assumption. Now I got myself a map, theta or theta 1, you could uh, call it, from S1 to G. One of them will work. One of them will be the extension of a rho up to a conjugation, as we saw. Uh, but I need to prove it. Um, it's, so it's a bit less simple than before. What I'll have to do now uh, is, I mean, I want to replace B2 by S2. Uh, but this will not be gamma. Now, I want to take a generic orbit here and replace uh, B2 by S2, as I did before, same trick. Uh, but this is not a gamma uh, ergodic space anymore. Right? But it is ergodic times S, uh, it is er under the gamma times S1 action, it is ergodic. So this is what I want to use. 
So now I will change my point of view and instead of viewing my representation as taking place in G, I will view my representation as taking place in G times G. I will now take this gamma times S2 space, gamma times S1 space, I'm sorry, it's the same acting group as here, and view this as a repre representation into the G times G space, I will identify this with G times G more the diagonal. Okay, so uh, so again, uh, maybe I'll rewrite this diagram here just to, to, to rewrite it in the fashion that we are used to. Uh, we have uh, S1 times S2, that S space, and we have G times G more diagonal, and we have gamma times S1 acting on this measured space and a map to uh, the acting group here, G times G. So uh, that, uh, since this is an element in the category, oh, this is an area of Gamma, gamma times S1 to G times G. That's how I want to think about it now. So once I have a, an area, and uh, this is a, a now diagonal is a, a subgroup, uh, um, maybe just add one more word. For the action for gamma times S1, acting on S1 times S2, which is ergodic. Once more, I'll use the gate theorem and take a gate for this action, for this representation. I mean, I want to emphasize, for this theorem, which is less trivial somehow, I need uh, some simplicity assum assumption on G. Previously, uh, this was complete general nonsense. And of course, I use simplicity over and over again. And now G times G is not so far from being simple itself. Uh, but it is not simple, and this is not a problem at this point. So uh, we have a gate. I replace delta now by, by another. Sorry, basic object is S1 times S2 to G times G mod M, unknown group. Maybe I can, I can call it H3 or something, uh, but I, I take a different name because it lives elsewhere. This is a subgroup of the diagonal inside G times G. And here I have the action, and here I have the G times G action. Uh, now, I want to claim that in fact M is delta. Uh, I didn't go any uh, lower. Uh, so, I want to assume that M is smaller than delta and get myself a contradiction. Or oh, not a contradiction, and, 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 and explain how I, I, I'm done in this case. Uh, then, okay, now delta, if I add to it any factor, left G or right G, which are normal groups, so I can take the product of delta with any of the factor, and, uh, and this will generate uh, G times G itself. If M is smaller, it is not enough to generate. So uh, this implies that uh, if I take first factor and 
take the product with m, this is less than g times g. And now I can uh, divide by it. So maybe I'll, I'll put the name, I'll give it a name. Okay, so now I can, uh, I'll take from here to g times g modulo this beast. I modded out the left G action. Uh, should it have been the right G action? Uh, sorry, I'm doing something stupid. Um, excuse me. So uh, this is G mod something. for the, the right acting group. This is, uh, but when I modded out uh, the left group action, I modded out, maybe I change, uh, I modded out the S1 action here. So uh, these factors via S2 to here. This is a gamma map. S, one of the factor, I, I think I interchanged them, but one of the factor was the reception of S1. And then I mod it out, modded it out, and uh, got something which now S1, on, on the quotient, S1 acts trivially. But the quotient, because m was assumed to be small, the quotient is something non-trivial. So I got, myself, uh, I got myself into such a situation. So actually this is not the situation I put in the box here, this is the situation I put in the box, I now put in the box here, I mean it's, we have a, maybe a stabilizer, but now I made a reduction using normalizing. Now, now G is simple and made a reduction and uh, obtained no, no stabilizer here. And I explained previously that under such, such a situation, I'm getting this thing and then that box and get extension of the uh, homomorphism. So what I'm trying to tell you now, again, let me repeat, is that in, if M is too little, then I can mod out one of the factor groups and uh, lose the S1 action and from this get extension as before, as using a lemma that I didn't uh, uh, phrase as a lemma. Only now I got Ah, st now still it's an extension to, to S2, okay? Is this clear? Uh, I know it's a lot to swallow altogether, but uh, okay, that's how life goes. Uh, it's a complicated proof a bit. And uh, so if I got an extension under this assumption, then with outlaws of generality, I will assume from now on that we have an equality here. And I'm in this setting. I'm here. Um, I'm having this one. Uh, so I proved that I can assume that this is uh, delta and this is the gate for uh, this action and this representation. And now I will use uh, the extra equivalence once more uh, that I just erased. Uh, 
I'll, I'll use here the extra symmetry that I have an S2 action. So actually, there is also an S2 acting here, commuting with the gamma action. And it will go into the normalizer in G times G of delta modulo delta, which act on the, on the other side here. I mean, I could have done it uh, before with them, but then I, I didn't have enough information. And there is, an, another, there is a piece of information I now have that this is delta we're talking about. And delta is its own normalizer in G times G. This guy over here is trivial. Because delta is the normalizer of delta. This follows from the fact that uh, G is a simple non-abelian group. So the equivalence under the S2 action here tells me that this map factors via S1. We cannot see the delta. And oh, I'm, I'm sorry. We should not use blue because of... Shall I rewrite? Uh, I, I'm not sure this is better. Um, OK. Uh, so now I have the normalizer of delta, which is delta itself. And I have a, a S2 uh, equivalence, uh, because S2 act here uh, and uh, commutes with the gamma times S1 action we have. And because it maps into this trivial group, the, the map here is S2 invariant. So it factors so, uh, via the S2 uh, invariance. So I'm getting actually a map from S1 to uh, G times G more delta, which recall, this is just G with left and right action. And, uh, and now, <laughs> OK, gamma times S1 goes to uh, G times G. We are back in such a situation that we know the map, uh, the row extends. And this is for the last time. I mean, under all the situation, uh, we are done, row extends, and, and we are happy. OK. Um, that was long, but um, as you see, it's just manipulation with things, and you do things that are forced on you, and you use extra symmetries, and there, is, there are no deep ideas in it. Uh, just using the, over and over again the idea of a, that the gate map gains extra symmetries, and with the product structure in a, inject extra symmetries in our situation. And, uh, and over and over again, we also use that, uh, the assumption of simplicity of G, which somehow forces things to go to, not to sub quotient, but to G itself. OK. So uh, uh, this is it for lattices in product. And uh, next time, I will discuss super rigidity will uh, super rigidity, uh, Manguli super rigidity for uh, higher rank uh, lattices. But uh, let me now uh, give a, a brief. So now uh, we are out of uh, proof mode. We, uh, discuss, you can breathe. Uh, we uh, discuss again. I, I want to say something uh, extra about uh, higher rank super rigidity, preparing uh, for next time, and also say something that uh, tell you a, a, a little story which is related. Um, so I'm erasing. I don't need any of this anymore. Are you just, just starting a brand new subject? Um, I'm not starting. A, I'm, I'm making a little discussion in preparation for next time. So next time I, I could. Uh, so I, I have an extra quarter of an hour. No? No?
Oh, if you're too tired. Uh, yeah, it will be light. No. Uh, I want to say something about Mongolian super rigidity. Um, and I, I will come back to this. So I just want. Uh, so uh, if S is a maybe a real semi-simple group. Or more generally, S itself is a, a, a group defined over a local field. And uh, gamma inside S, an irreducible lattice, so classical situation, uh, then uh, if we have gamma to G, and this is case simple group, all this assumption of ours, Z dense map, and unbounded, ah, of higher rank, of course. An axiom which I will discuss. So now this is just a brief. Then uh, Maguli's super rigidity says that under such assumption we have extension. Now, uh, we have two cases to consider. S is a product. And this case is done. Or it is, it is done by this more general uh, theorem that I proved uh, that uh, did not assume any algebraic structure on S, only the product structure. Semi-simple, uh, non-simple, in fact, falls into this picture. Uh, or uh, S is simple of higher rank. And this we'll do next time. But now I want to, to tell you that we are very close to it and to say uh, something about uh, uh, the relevant idea. Uh, so, but now an example here will be SL3 over a local field, maybe SL3R. Uh, so now let, let me uh, make an attempt. Next time we'll approach this problem more scientifically and we develop new machinery, new heavy machinery, uh, just an, elabor an elaboration of this category of representation I uh, explained so far, but it will be an extra layer of work. So now I want to explain how uh, just using these things that we have over here already gives us a uh, match. And uh, so, sorry, Pierre, but uh, not, uh, not how things, only uh, one, one idea. So consider inside S the group T, which is not a diagonal group, not the full diagonal group, but a singular one inside S. Now S is SL3. It is important group. Uh, I mean, we know it is associated with the wall of the, of the vial chamber. Uh, one thing about it is that uh, this is amenable. It is a billion. Non-compact. So these two things put uh, S mod T as an S space, also uh, then as, as a gamma space, uh, as an amenable and ME uh, space. Remember, amenability here just follow for amenability of T, but the ME here uh, assumption is a special property of, uh, of simply groups, that I know that the gamma action on S mod T is ME. This is something I, I, I sold you last time. Uh, so we have this, but also, uh, this group was chosen, I could have chosen the full diagonal group, the, it will have the same property, but this group has a, a huge centralizer. So by this you gain extra symmetries. Uh, centralizer, um, also normalizer for that matter, uh, is the full GL2 that you see here. I mean, it's GL2 here because I 
put here that inverse of a matrix. And uh, uh, if you call this n, then n, n mod t is PGL2. This piece over here tells me that if I, I, I want to run an argument as before for proving super rigidity, uh, I, will give, I will get S mod T, take a lower level, S mod T into some G mod H, and here I'll have the gamma action, but also a normalizer in S of T, and here I'll have, sorry, I will have PGL too acting commutingly on this, and I will map it here somewhere. So in particular, I will get a map from PGL2 uh, to something non-trivial. So out of a gamma representation, I'm getting a representation of a big group already. Uh, maybe it is trivial. Uh, but one can prove that uh, it is non-trivial by a technique that I, I will take a different approach, but by such a technique I, I can uh, uh, show that, uh, but, but there is a technique to show it is non-trivial. And you see, we are quite close to have uh, an extension of a gamma action just by this simple technique. So this is before I worked further, which I will next time, and uh, make an extra category of representations. And now, in, in a few minutes, I want to tell you a story. I will not write down things. Uh, how this idea uh, helped us with uh, uh, Capras and Le Cure to, to prove uh, a, a, very, a theorem that I like a lot. And uh, this theorem that we proved uh, is about uh, non-linearity of a group acting on A2 tilde buildings. Now, SL3 over a local field, it acts on a, an A2 tilde building, the Bruatitz building. If, if the field is R, is, uh, we have a symmetric space. If the, if the field is uh, uh, non archimedean uh, then we, uh, we act on a, uh, on a building. And this space, S mod T, is what uh, one calls uh, the singular Cartan flow. So we have an action, uh, we have an energetic flow that one can construct, I mean, now in, in my discussion now, gamma is not a lattice in a Lie group S. Uh, ga gamma is, uh, it acts geometrically on a certain geometric object, uh, which maybe does not have extra symmetries, but one can imitate this space and construct a metrically ergodic and amenable space we call the Cartan flow and study representation of this. And out of this, find a representation of another group, PGL2, which now is not uh, discrete anymore, but a, a continuous group. So if you have an A2 tilde building, and, and this is the, something I learned and I want to share this in, information because I think it's beautiful. If you have an A2 tilde building, um, out of it, uh, you can construct, I mean, if, if, even if it does not have symmetries at all, uh, a priori, as, as an object, you can construct a, a huge group called the projectivity groups. At infinity, we have a projective plane. If the building is not classical, it's not a Boatitz building, uh, this projective plane is not classical. So it's a, an exotic projective plane. Maybe it does not have uh, symmetries. Uh, the, the classical one are acted by PGL3 of a field. Non-classical maybe does not have symmetries, but uh, they do have partial symmetries and a rich group of such, and uh, man, maybe you saw it if you played with uh, finite projective planes. Uh, with, I think now of, as a, of a projective plane as an instance geometry uh, feature, and uh, for finite projective planes, one usually proves that uh, we have the same number of points on, on every line, right? Which, by the way, is related to a, a, an open conjecture. Is this necessarily a prime power plus one? 
but the thing is that we have something happens for every line. And why is this? Because we have uh, perspectivities. If we have uh, one line and another line, I can take a, a point uh, out of this picture and to each point here, I have a, a, a unique line through this point and it must intersect this and I get a, a point here. So this gives me a bijection between these lines. So somehow these two things are uh, related by a symmetry coming from here. And this gives us some uh, groupoid of symmetries of, of this object. And uh, if you think of the stabilizer in this groupoid of one object, of, of one line, we get a very, very rich group of symmetries, again, of, uh, of, of lines. And uh, if we have started with a projective plane which comes from the, the boundary of an A to tilde building, uh, each such line, projective line, could be thought of uh, as a boundary of a tree. And uh, we get a, a very rich group, a street transitive group acting on the boundary of a tree just out of this uh, geometric interpretation. And this group is that one. And just by constructing such a thing and working quite hard to show some ergodistic property of this, we get a, a representation of, uh, of the pro projectivity group. And we show in particular that uh, this group uh, is linear if and only if this locally compact group simple locally compact group is linear if and only if the building is classical. And this is much easier to show. I mean, it's, it's not a triviality, but it's much easier to show. And by this, we show that, uh, and by playing with such a game, we show that this gamma, a group of symmetries of an A to tilde building, is linear if and only if the, field, the, the, uh, the building is classical. So uh, I just wanted to share with you this by, in a seminar fashion. This is not part of, uh, of the course. And so I took this uh, extra 15 minutes. Sorry for that. Uh, so, but, but this follows from the same idea of uh, proving super rigidity. And next time, we are going to attack these questions. And again, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to construct yet another layer of complication on the category. Uh, of representation of ours, but it will be worth it. So uh, stay with me. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>